I, I am thrilled that you're all here. I know some of you may be in Florida and we have, you know, potential hurricane and all this kind of a stuff, but the transition from F1 to H1B can be its own little hurricane. <laughs> so uh, I am glad that you're um, dividing your energy and being here with me. So with that in mind, um, we're going to be talking about navigating the F1 to the H1B. Many, so the, the webinar is intended for employers, but of course, some of you that are here are for nationals, and this will also is things that you need to know. So I'm going to talk about primarily what the employers need to be doing, but it also, you know, what uh, foreign workers need to understand about this process. <laughs> H1B is more scary than the hurricane. Thanks about that. I love the sense of humor. <laughs> okay, so I also, I am trying to be very mindful that you're all very busy. So I am keeping this to the essentials. So it's a 30 minute presentation. I, I do go fairly fast to cover all of that. Um, I may try to bring it down to 20 so that I can allow you to um, a little bit of time to ask questions. So we'll see how that goes. Um, key responsibilities during the transition, payroll and tax implications. This is something that sometimes gets forgotten. Travel considerations post-transition post and come up with pitfalls, how to avoid them. Also... Tomorrow, I believe, is HR Day. So to all of you HRs, um, talent acquisition, HR professionals, thank you for all you do. I know you have a lot on your plates and our workforces would not be what they are if it wasn't for you. So we very, very much appreciate your partnership, your engagement, and everything you do for everyone that you touch. So know that we are grateful to you and thinking of you. Um, again, we're here just for a very short time. So turn off the phone, stay with me. I think that's the best way that you're going to be able to grasp what I'm going to tell you in a very quick fashion. Every case is unique. So again, with my legal hat in mind, um, just know that this is general information and obviously for our clients, we are talking to you consistently to make sure that we address the uniqueness of your cases. And so I'm actually doing something very, not very different, but a little different. I will always, always struggle because it's, if for you, got, for you all that are here with me live, I know that you're you're having to make a sacrifice or a, a balance. Okay, should I be there or should I be doing something else? And I always ask my team, I don't know. I would really would like to do something a little extra for those of you that attend live. So finally, it came to me because I'm actually writing another book. But I have this Beyond the H1B book that is pretty awesome, if I could say so. So at the end of this uh, webinar... For those of you that are here attending live, Danny is has the, the responsibility hat of doing a little raffle, and we will be giving out, giving away one of these books that is on Amazon now for $20 or something like that. So we'll be mailing it to you. I say thank you for being here. Yay. Oh, some of you have the book. Okay, well, you may get two and you can give it away to someone else that would benefit, but I thank you for that. <laughs> Awesome. Okay. Well, so that's what I'm doing. And like I said, I, I hope the, the, you know, the great winner will enjoy it. And if not, we'll pass it on. Thanks, Vyra. We'll pass it on to someone else that could um, benefit from it. And you'll hear more about my other book that is coming. So it's kind of a, an extension of this one, but with, with the stories. Okay, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Giselle. I've been doing this for 20 years, so I have a lot of stories to talk about. And it's our pleasure and our passion to do what we do. It's, it's not easy to practice immigration, and, um, and we can only do it because I have a tremendous team and because all of you, our clients, partner with us so well. So 
again, thank you to you for being here and for um, working with us. If you're not connected with me on LinkedIn, please do so. You can take your phones, scan me. I post a lot of things on, on LinkedIn that are not, that you wouldn't get otherwise. And it's just a, a quick way to stay connected to. So with all of that in mind, um, I also want to make sure that you're interacting with me, that you're again, you're you're here. <laughs> so tell me on the chat on a scale of one to ten, what would what would you would what do you consider your level of knowledge to be about this transition from F1 to H1? On a scale of one to ten, ten being high, one being low. So F1 to H1B, some of you may have done it before. Okay, cool. Awesome. Fabulous. All right, my goal is always that, okay, some of you are pros, so you can be, I may, I may unmute you and have you come on to the call with me. Um, my goal is that you're going to learn a little something um, every time that, you, that you're here with me. So we, I hope to see a higher number or even a nine plus or something by the end of this. Okay, key employer responsibilities. One of the biggest things is the updating of the I-9 form. So for all of you, your H-1B workers, um, they're in F-1 status. Hopefully they were selected on the first. And actually just yesterday, I no, we got a receipt notice. We haven't received the approval yet on the, on the second lottery. So, so that person, for example, may not become an H-1B worker until when that petition gets approved. So it could be, who knows, October 20th. But for those that, you, the, that were part of the first lottery, most of those, if not all of those cases, I mean, all of mine have, are, are approved right now. So they will be transitioning to H-1B status October 1st. So that means an updating of their I-9 verification. For some of you, or most of you likely, they were already with you as an e with, with their F-1 EAD, and you had done a verification on Section 2 with that EAD. But now, as part of the H-1B, they will be going, you would be doing, likely, in general, many of you are going to be doing Supplement B, where you're going to be using the H-1B approval notice. The bottom of the approval notice has a, a 994, and that's what you're going to be using for the update of the I-9. I think I have a sample later on. I can't remember. But that is, so updating the I-9, complying with the LCA requirements. So for every, this is unique to the H-1B, and it doesn't apply in every case, but what has what happens sometimes is that the F1 worker had a salary determined by that status and what they were doing. But as they move into the O onto the H1B status October 1st, the wage may be higher because they're moving into a different position. And in and depend on depending with, with what the wage said on the LCA, this is something else that you need to look at. Some some of them, their their wage may change, so make sure that that your their the salary um, that becomes effective October first matches the LCA as part of the H one B process. Also, so these are all unique to H one Bs. No other visa has an LCA or a public access file. Public access files we create for our clients, but it's for our clients to maintain. And there is certain do documents that need to be included in the public access file. We send them to you, we prepare them and, and send them to you electronically. And those are required for in case of the Department of Labor or some other agency comes and inspects you, those need to be available, okay? And effective communication, I mean, as everything that I've talked about here requires you to stay in touch with the foreign worker uh, to make sure that this is, well, primarily the updating of the I-9 form um, and complying with the LCA. The rest of the stuff is things that, that you, you know, that you, that you do. Oh, so I do have a sample. Um, so this is a sample of the Supplement B, the new I-9 form now that we're using. 
So you would be using, like I said, the form I-94, the, 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 the form number itself, the expiration. So ideally you have a three year um, H-1B status. So this is kind of what it would look like. If you did the alternative procedure, which for many of you, if you're an E-Verify employer, you could do this where you're not actually looking at the foreign worker face-to-face -face like we used to do before, but you can do the virtual verification. In the case that you do that, you would click this little box down here that's sometimes kind of invisible. So that's why I'm pointing it out to you because um, I don't know that many people know that that is there if they're doing virtual verification. So far, so good? Yes, tell me in the chat. Okay, I have something else for you. Um, so use, this is really good. Um, a few months ago, I was gonna do a, and I actually ended up doing it. It was a key immigration terms webinar, but we had a issue with the link. So that meant not many people showed up. Uh, many people registered. And I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize that this was going to be such a hot topic. So because I felt bad about what had happened, I actually took the content of the webinar and I created a guide on key immigration terms. So it, we pour our heart and souls. Now, it, I, it was difficult because there's like PERM and LCA. So far, you've already heard me say many weird terms, PATH. So we... I, I outlined them in the guide, organized them in categories so they would make a little bit more sense, but it's really a good tool for you to use. So another, another bonus for you guys. Um, if you don't learn anything about the H1, F1 to H1B, hopefully this will also, will give you a, a, a you know, a boost in knowledge. Um, okay. Payroll and tax implications. So this is something that, very important. Um, when the foreign worker is in F1 status, they're exempt, for, I, I believe it's for five years, they're exempt from FICA. But when they transition to H1B status, that FICA exemption goes away. Now, I'm not a tax accountant, I'm not a financial person, so this is something that you do need to talk to your finance accountant people just to make sure that you're doing it correctly. I'm just putting this here as a FYI for you that, and for the foreign workers that are here, your, your, your paycheck may go just down a little because you're going to be paying into this um, benefits. Um, for some of you also, there may be a, a change in benefits uh, as you as you transition into one status. Again, these are just things for HR and for you all to look into. It, so these are just FYI. And again, consult with our experts, accountants, payroll to make sure that, that whatever this things, if anything needs to happen, that is being done correctly. So again, this is just warning for you. Okay. Something else that is going to happen, travel considerations. And this can be complicated for HR sometimes to understand. Sometimes uh, foreign workers need to have a better understanding of this just because they've been through it to get an F1, F1 visa. The, the visa in their passport and this is this can get confusing, and that's one of the things also that I talk in the uh, key immigration terms. The visa and their passport is different from their H one B visa status that they they're moving into when they're in the United States. The visa and their passport does not determine how long they can be in the United States, but it determines whether they can enter the United States, so they can leave. Men, you know, they, they can leave and go whatever they want. The problem is coming back. And many of them are going to want to be going home at some point, whether it is for the holidays coming up or next year because somebody's getting married or who knows. But they're going to want to travel abroad 
and come back. They cannot come back on an F1 visa in their passport. They're going to have to, the visa and their passport needs to correspond if they're going to travel with their status that they have in the United States. I'll give you an example. Just yesterday, um, we filed an H1B that when I review the case, she came into the United States in F1 status in 2018. She's in H1B now, but she has never left the United States. So she still has... Her I-94 record from CVP is F1. Her visa stamp was still F1, but her status in the United States was H1B, and it had been since, I think she transferred to H1B in 2022 or something like that, but she hasn't left. So that's, that's okay. The next time she leaves the United States, she would have to go to a consular post, typically the home country, particularly if it's the first time they're getting a new visa, a new category, and go through the consular process similar to what they had to do to get an F1, they would have to be doing something similar to get an H-1B visa stamp in their passport, and that is how they enter into the United States. So I hope I covered that. I, I, was, I slowed my pace because this can be confusing. Again, it is only needed if they're going to travel abroad and come back to the United States. When they come back in, I also tell our foreign workers, always, always check your I-94 record from CBP. So CBP, when they go into the, the officer, the immigration officer at the, at the airport, they're going to be asked certain questions. They're going to show their passport. And that officer is required to make an electronic entry of admission. And that electronic entry is gonna say, this person enter in such a status, H-1B, and it's valid until whatever date. It doesn't always match the validity of their H-1B status that USCIS gave. And there's reasons for this. For now, the main message that I want to pass to the foreign workers that are here is to make sure that you do verify your I-94 record when you come back into the United States to make sure that it's correct because they do make mistakes. I have L1s that have been stamped as B1s, um, shortened validities and, and other things. And the quicker you get back with CVP and correct it, the better it's going to be for you. Okay. Okay. So some of the stuff to watch out for when you're doing um, the travel, visa stamping, stamping delays. You don't know how many times, and it actually happened last year, especially during the holidays, they are delays. You cannot just assume that you can leave and that you're going to get an appointment or that you're going to be able to do the mail-in, the consulates, as many other places, there's people taking vacations, their staffing is low, they have more work. So just be very, very proactive. And I'm saying to HR, if you have a foreign worker that is coming to you and saying, I want to take time off to go to visit my family during their holidays, that's all great. But they have to do it proactively and not wait until the last minute because they may not be able to come back when they want to come back for various, various reasons. One of the reasons could be something that is called administrative processing. And it's, it's a nebulous word. If for some reason, when, CV, when the consulate goes into their electronic record and they cannot connect with the, with the records that USCIS should have put in there, if they cannot confirm the status of the person or some other things, they will put that person under something called administrative processing, which again, is a very nebulous term they use for many things. So you really don't know what is going on. You just know that the visa will not be issued within five days or six days. It could take two weeks. It could take a month. And you never know when that is going to happen. So again, being proactive is really, really important. And of course, as we know, you know, travel bans and all kinds of things happen. So again, proactive, 
is the key when, when we're planning travel abroad. So again, best practices, plan ahead, encourage the, your employees to be proactive about scheduling these appointments, avoid unnecessary travel unless it's required, especially during the transition period. Um, I did a webinar, many of you may have attended at the beginning of the year when we were doing, um, when we were going through the cap season. And I did a, you know, what to expect during the registration. You were selected, now what? You were not selected, now what? And every single time I mentioned, please, please, please don't plan on traveling during this time. I can probably tell you that I've, that I, and my staff that is here can tell you between then, you know, April 1st, when the, when the, the visa numbers were issued and now we've probably had 20 foreign nationals reach out to us during that time. They were in, in cap gap or they were STEM was pending. Oh, I want to travel. Oh, I want to travel. Oh, I want to travel abroad. All kinds of reasons. And I was like, well, you're taking a chance. You're taking a chance because anything could happen and your five years that you have put into schooling and everything else you can be giving away if you cannot come back in time to get into an H-1B status. So now for, this is the end now of the period. So I always told them or said, wait until October 1st. Well, wait and, until you actually move into H-1B status and then you can plan your travel, always knowing that you're gonna have to renew or get a new visa when you come back, okay? Monitoring processing times, again, going back to being proactive, looking at the calendars of the post and seeing what how long it's taking for appointments to be given and prepare for contingencies. It may not happen, but I can probably tell you we've had three or four people that went abroad and they had to make arrangements to work remotely because Things happen. People that were sick got sicker or, you know, they couldn't come back for some reason. So just also keep that in mind. Potentially, it may not happen and that's great. But if it does, at least you have a plan in place. We do offer, so I put this in here because it consular processing affects many areas of the immigration process. And I've, I've, gone back and forth with my team as to what can we do that is fairly, very, very reasonable, very inexpensive. If you do need assistance with consular processing. Um, so we have tier one and tier two, which are $400 and $600. Again, very, very affordable for the level of service that you get. So consider that. And then of course we have the red carpet, which is 3000 that it's, mostly executive managers and whatnot that go into that tier, but for others that they just, you know, they need a, a review of the DS-160, answer questions, da, da, da. We do have those two packages. Again, very, very affordable for the service that you will get and making sure that your process is as efficient as it can be and prevent getting stuck abroad. Um, okay. Things to watch out for, and I'm kind of repeating here, but you don't know how many audits I do, and the I-9s have not been updated because they forget or because they don't know what to do. Now you have a kind of a sample of what to do. You're always, you know, you can always, you're one of our clients, you can reach out to us if you have questions as to how to do the I-9. But as we transition again to potentially new administration or whoever it is, I, and whoever is that we're an ex president, there is always going to be changes to the immigration process, no matter what. Um, audits are not going to go away. And it can cost a lot of money. I-9 I compliance, if you do get audited, it's, it's not only is a nightmare, it's very stressful, but it also costs a lot of money. So you can avoid that by, again, making sure that your I-9s are up to date. Again, payroll inconsistencies can create a lot of problems. So make sure that you you check into that. We talked about travel. We talked about maintaining the open license of communication. Okay, ensuring a smooth transition. Okay, so now it's your, I'm, I'm 225. So I, I've covered a lot of what I wanted to cover. Tell me on the chat, 
hopefully you've learned something new between, you know, 20 minutes ago and now. So tell me in the chat, what have you learned? One thing that is maybe new or maybe it's like, oh yeah, that's a great reminder. Let me know that you're paying attention. <laughs> Good. Okay, what else? Yeah, yeah. Oh my God, I'm glad that some of you that are very high, very, um, no, many of you have done, have been doing this for a while. So I, I'm glad that, that you have all um, learned a little bit. So now this is your time too, to also grade yourself. How, did we go up to a 9.1 or a 9.2 or a 6.9, whatever, whatever you were before? <laughs> Tell me where you're at now. Yeah. Yeah, again, <laughs> thanks. Yeah, uh, like I said, the FICA issue, I'm just putting it out there as an FYI. Um, so you you do need to check with someone that practices in that area, but it's, it's something that some, you know, I get a lot of questions about that because people read about it. It's like, oh, I didn't realize. So yeah. Okay, Danny, did you run a... Um, what do we call it? Uh, an H1B lottery. So I'm going to give you time to do that while I go to the next slide and then you can come back and tell me who the winner is of our book. Um, something else that I've, I actually, oh my God, Jane, yay! Woohoo! That's awesome. Jane, I have not talked to you in the longest time. So maybe this is a sign that we need to get together. And I'm so glad that you're here. So this is awesome. Congratulations. Yay. Oh, I see Danny that you gave it to me as a direct, direct message. So she didn't see her name. So I'm glad I just. Ah, fabulous. Jane, are you still with us? Hopefully you're happy. So what I was going to um, mention, yeah, she's still here. Um, next month, um, some of you know that I have a, a YouTube channel. Again, a lot of information in there. But I've been tiptoeing. You know, we're going into the... <laughs> so please re-gift. Well, we'll send it to you if you want, and you can give it to somebody else. Or yeah, we can do a second, we can do a second raffle. What do you want us to do? Let's have a second lottery. Okay, there we go. Second raffle. All right, we'll see. Thanks, Jane. <laughs> there we go. I think it's a it's a general consensus. That's that's really nice of you. <laughs> Thanks. Well, Danny, back to you. So while you do that, um, next month. Oh, there we go. Lena Diaz. Lena, did you say you have a copy of my book? <laughs> it must be a really good resource. <laughs> okay, fabulous. Okay, so you get it. I wasn't sure. It was like, oh, maybe she has one too. <laughs> okay, well, you're the winner. Yay. So Danny will circle back with you and uh, check to where you want us to mail it to and enjoy. Yeah, I mean, it's been nice to read from others that do have it, that they use it as a good resource. So yeah, it's a lot of work to put that something like that together. Okay, so next month, uh, the webinar is going to be about the Trump and Harris administration on immigration. Excited about that? <laughs> so I do a Q&A first. So we did one last month, last week on some of the topics that we just talked about. My next Q&A for October is I'm going to talk about why is it so hard for, for workers to come legally to the United States? What are the difference? between the Trump and Harris administration proposals. And I said, you know, the, the Q and A's are typically seven to 10 minutes. So it's short, but it's just a general, you don't have time to be here. Um, and how can employers be, best prepare for potential changes? So that's a Q and A. So you're all, you're gonna get a, a link to that. 
And then you're going to be getting the emails about the webinar, which I'll be doing something similar to this on the last, typically it's the last Wednesday of the month. Okay. And that's it. Thank you for being here. Uh, with all the immigration related stress, she's still attending your women. Oh, thank you so much. I I appreciate that. And I appreciate all of you for, I mean, it would be pretty boring for me to just be talking to myself for half an hour. <laughs> so I appreciate you all. Look forward to seeing you at the next webinar on LinkedIn and whatever I bump into you. Have a beautiful day, everybody. And stay safe if you're in Florida. Bye.